Welcome to I Am, I Have, brought to you by Happiful Magazine and Counselling Directory. I'm Lucy Donoghue. Now we all have mental health and some of us will experience or live with mental illness, but that doesn't define who we are. Through I Am, I Have, we'll meet with some wonderful people who have spoken out about mental health and illness and find out more about who they are and the passions that shape their lives, as well as their reflections on their own mental health. We hope you'll join us and share your thoughts on social media using the hashtag I am, I have. We're so very happy and privileged to welcome the wonderful Estée Lalonde. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. And what an intro. And our first guest as <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, no pressure. It's wonderful. Thank you. So... I am, I have. It's all about who we really are. So rather than me telling everyone about you, um, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, if that's okay. I can absolutely try. This is one of the most nerve-wracking parts for me because I never really know how to introduce myself. But I am a content creator on the internet. So I make YouTube videos and Instagram content and I share my life. And I've been doing that for the past sort of nine years, which is crazy. Um, I'm also a podcast host. Host, and I just recently released a jewelry range, which is fun. And I'm always doing different projects here and there. But mostly I feel like my job is just to share my life. That's amazing. So the first I am you gave us uh, is one that's very close to my heart, which is I am a dog lover. I am a dog lover. Where should we start on that? I mean, we can talk about dogs for the next hour if you would like. Okay. I have a dog. I have a greyhound. His name is Reggie. He is an ex-racing greyhound. And I adopted him when he was six years old and he's almost 12 he's 12 now so and what does Reggie mean to you Reggie is everything to me that dog has taught me so much about patience and just slowing down in general he is a very anxious dog um, I don't know how much you actually want to talk about greyhounds come on tell me about his anxiety <laughs> so greyhounds have um you know they can have a really sad upbringing and a really hard upbringing because they're obviously racing dogs which um, if you've gathered I am not a fan of no um, so they have a really tough life and when we got him my ex-boyfriend and I when we got him he had never even been indoors before he'd never had a family he had never even been around other dogs except greyhounds and he didn't even know how to play with toys we got him a little toy and he literally did not know what to do with it it was That's so sad i know it was really really sad so really the first year um year and a half was just kind of teaching him like how to be a dog and just showing him love and affection. And it was all so new to him. And it's really been beautiful to um, see him come out of his shell. That's amazing. I was watching your video, 20 Things You Love About Reggie. I had to start myself at 20. Did you? Yeah. Could you have gone on? Oh, my gosh. Of course. And and how do you find Reggie helps you on a day-to-day -day basis? Before we started talking on the podcast, we were saying that that dogs really keep you in the moment. Do you, do you find that's the case with Reggie? Absolutely. I think one thing about Reggie is he gives me a sense of structure because I work from home and I'm home alone all day, every day in my apartment behind my computer. So he gives me a reason to wake up in the morning and walk him every single morning, every single afternoon, every night before bed. So he gives me some sense of structure. He also gets me outside. He's always there for me. And it's so amazing if, you know, you've got a stressful day and you come home and you just see your dog there. I'm sure all the dog or animal lovers out there will understand, like, you just come home and everything kind of melts away. Nothing matters. There's no judgment. There's nothing. It's just love, pure love. I love it. And they love you no matter what you look like, yep. no matter what your mood is, yep. no matter what time of day it is. Yep. So I have a dog and when I wake up and go downstairs in the morning, it's literally like I'm a rock star <laughs> every single morning. And uh, for me as well, that's a brilliant thing to lift my mood. And I've met more people. I don't know if you've met more people through having a dog. That's a really good tip, actually. One of my best friends, her name is Lucy. She also has a greyhound called Rafiki. So Reggie and Rafiki are best friends. They celebrate at a birthday together. Very Good. cute. Um, yeah, I actually just met her one day in the park and I never would have known her otherwise. And I do. I meet all my neighbors, so many people, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I absolutely think everybody should have a dog <laughs> and a rescue dog as yes. well. Yes. Adopt, if, don't shop. Yes. Yeah. We're going to move on to your next. Okay. So your next I am is I am evolving. 
I am evolving. Oh my gosh, it's exhausting just thinking about it. Really? Well, kind of. I guess it's a positive thing. But um, depending on the day, it's either exhausting or exciting. Um, but I feel like I've just been going through so many changes. And for those of you listening who maybe aren't familiar with my story, I moved um, to the UK when I was 19 from Canada. So I moved away from my entire family, and I kind of started everything new here in the UK, and I love London so much, and I was in a really long relationship, a very loving, kind relationship, but sadly, it has come to an end last year, so I... I became single at the age of 27, and that was the first time I'd ever really been a single woman. So I had to start over. So the past year has been quite a journey. I can imagine. <laughs> say the least. And what have you found in that last year? I mean, obviously, oh. you will have had highs and lows. The end of any relationship brings that. Yeah. Um, but it also brings new pathways and, and new ways of seeing the world. Because yeah. when you're in a relationship, you think for two. Well, yeah. most of us think for two mm-hmm. when we're in a relationship. Yeah. So what have you found? I mean, I have so many thoughts on this subject, but in general, I just have found that I'm obviously so much more independent. I've had to be. I've been doing things that I maybe wouldn't have done before. Um, Simple things like traveling by myself or, you know, just everything that I'm doing, I feel like I'm doing it just for me. Yeah. And that's been it was very scary in the beginning, obviously. But now I'm really loving it. I'm enjoying it. I love being single. Um, It's great. It's great. But it it is, you know, it's one of those things where when you are used to having a companion for so long, you have someone to lean on. You've got someone to depend on. When suddenly you don't have that, you can feel like you're free falling a little bit. Um, But I feel like I've come to a really good place now where I'm comfortable with just having myself to depend on. That's really wonderful to hear. And I think it's important for people to see that as well. And I think you can see that through your vlogs. Mm. Um, And do you want to talk a bit about how you've evolved through your vlogs as well? Because it must be really interesting. You said you've been doing this for around nine years. You have this library you have this life library, which is also public, that you can go back through and look and, oh. and see how you have evolved. How does that feel? I can't even think about it, honestly. I, um, you know, it's a simple, like, so I did an event recently where somebody brought my book. And I wrote my book a couple years ago. And I think my book is now from a past life, you know, because it was a little bit about my story. And it was so crazy to even look at the book again because it just feels like a different lifetime ago. And that's how I look at these vlogs as well. It's just from a completely different time. Like, it's me, but yeah. I almost don't even recognize the person. Yeah. But if I look back to my old videos, the ones that I first started making, I'm so shy. I'm so self-conscious. I'm so unsure about myself, I feel like. And making these videos, I mean, there are positives and negatives to it, which we can discuss, but it's just, it's given me such a sense of confidence for some reason, even though it's so scary. I just feel like I've had to put myself out there in so many weird, random situations. And now I've just kind of really gotten to know who I am through it. But it is embarrassing looking back at all that stuff. Like if I, for instance, so I'm single. So if I'm going to start dating someone new, they can go on the internet, Google my name and see all these embarrassing videos from when I was like 21. It's, it is awful. That's true. I hadn't thought about that. No, dating is the worst for that. But also there's something really transparent and open about that. You are who you are. Yeah. (laughs) And the person who is going to date you will be very lucky, quite frankly. So. Well, that's really nice to say. Yeah. I'm not embarrassed by it, but it's, it's more just, it's almost being vulnerable because there's no way to hide it. Everything's accessible. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's nothing bad that's gone on you know it's just like videos of me making banana bread when I'm 22 or whatever it is (laughs) but it's like it's just it's just a bit much you know sometimes it can be very overwhelming sometimes I choose when to reveal those bits to your exactly there's no choosing to reveal anything it's all right there um but like you said I'm not really trying to to hide it so and how do you feel about younger Estee when you watch it do you feel a sense of compassion or how how is that in in thinking about how you've moved on through your life oh my gosh I just sometimes wish I could go back in time and just say something in my ear um what would you say 
I think I would probably just say, you know, keep going, keep staying on this path. This is what you're meant to be doing. And everything's going to be okay. I remember so many times thinking like, what am I doing? I'm making these videos and like, I'm talking about makeup products. I'm not even good at makeup. Like, what am I? I don't know. There's just a lot of questions about it. And when I first started, there was nobody was making a career out of this. Um, So I I really didn't know. I remember when I told my mom I was dropping out of university and I was going to do YouTube full time. And what was her response? Well, she was actually very positive about it. But I think in my head, I was like, okay, can I do this? Do I really think I can do this? And now you know you can. And now apparently I can. We'll have to come back in 10 years and revisit it. <laughs> do you ever think forward in that way? What What is this going to look like in 10 years? Because as you said, when you started, this wasn't, people weren't doing this as a full-time job. And now it's a it's an industry. Right. What do you think? Well, All I do is think about the future. I actually very rarely think about the past these days. I am so obsessed with the future. And that's something that I'm really working on is trying to stay present, um, which I am very bad at. Um, But exactly, you have no idea what's going to happen in the future. I don't really think I'm going to be making YouTube videos in the same way in 10 years. You know, I'll be 38. I'm 40. I mean, (laughs) what were were you doing 10 years ago? Probably something completely different. 10 years ago. Oof. Yeah, something completely you know? I'm not going to say, but something <laughs> completely different. And I wouldn't have imagined this 10 years ago. But that's the amazing thing about life, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That that it takes us on all these kind of twists and turns. And like you said, the best thing we can do is enjoy the moment because what do they say? The, the past isn't, it has gone and the, yeah. the future we will never know. We can worry. Exactly. But, but there's no way of knowing, so... That's the word on the street. That is the word on the street. From the wise people. That's that's not the phrase. <laughs> I'll remember the phrase after you've gone, but we get the gist. So we're going to move on to your third I am. Okay. Which is I am a traveler. I am a traveler. I travel a lot. I have traveled more in the past year or two than I have maybe in my entire life. I'm always on the move. And I am done for now. Really? I'm I'm actually staying in London for... Six weeks. I thought you were going to say six months then. No. (laughs) Six weeks. Six weeks. And that is huge for me. So I spend a lot of my time in New York and then a lot of my time in London. Yeah. And lots of things come up in between. And I am always on the move, but I am exhausted. Yeah. I actually just got back from New York four or five days ago. And my body has just shut down. When I walked into my apartment, I was like, okay, girl, stay put. It told you. Yeah. I mean, I I think that I, you know, one of my favorite things to do is literally physically run away from my problems. Okay. So if I'm going to have to stay put in one place, I might have to do some soul searching. That's scary. That sounds good, though. Does it? It's a good time to do it. (laughs) Christmas? Yeah. Christmas, New Year, (laughs) good time to look to the future and things. There's always alcohol around, so I feel like it is a good time. (laughs) I mean, we were talking about that earlier. It's it's always a good time. Um, You said you're between London and New York quite a lot. Is there a difference between London Estee and New York? Oh, my gosh. Yes. I've never answered this in like an interview or anything before. Have you not? <sighs> Juicy. Oh, this is juicy. Well, when I'm in New York, I am, I don't want to say I'm partying, but you know, through my entire 20s, I never partied. I never went out. I never did any of that stuff. I actually didn't drink any alcohol up until last year. I thought I was allergic, but it actually just turns out I was hungover. <laughs> It just hit me so hard. I like that. I like that. So, um, yeah. So I've discovered that. And I've really started to enjoy dancing and clubbing. And I know this sounds crazy, um, but I find it to be such an interesting stress reliever to just yeah. let your body go. Move. Move. Move your body and just be free. So I, when I'm in New York, I love to go out. I love to dance. And I go to New York a lot for inspiration. Yeah. I have so many friends out there who are doing so many cool things and amazing things. And I always get very inspired. Um, So I am a little bit different in New York. And then when I'm in London, I'm usually working. So I work constantly when I'm in London and hang out with my dog and really keep it chill on the weekends and weekdays. Yeah. So I feel like that's the difference. London, New York. Yeah. Different versions I even dress different in New York. Do you? Yeah. It's so weird. It's like leather mini skirts and like latex jackets. Ooh. And what, what do you think that does for you in terms of an outlet? 
you know, and in, in, in terms of, you know, we're talking about mental health and release and yeah. looking after ourselves. Do you think that is a release for you yes. to go somewhere else and kind of take off, literally take off the work jacket and put on the little latex number <laughs> and go out partying? Is it? Yeah, I think it is because I spend so much of my work life which is my real life, showing everything that I do. Mm -hmm. And I feel like sometimes when I go to New York, I'm still working a little bit there. Like, you know, I'm always Instagramming and stuff like that. But I feel like I can be a little more free with myself. I think I put a lot of limits on myself and boundaries on myself. But I feel like I go to New York to kind of think, okay, Esta, you can breathe a little bit more. You can chill. You can relax. You can do you. And I still feel like I do me in London, but that's really like where I go to kind of have fun fun. And I do think it's a release. I think it's just kind of like me telling myself you're in control and you can do what you want to do and you can go have fun and you can be this person you never thought you were. I used to think that I wasn't cool enough to like go dancing and like go to wear wear a leather miniskirt, you know. (laughs) But you know what I mean? I, I really I really thought that. So I remember the first time I went out to a club in New York and I put on my outfit and I was so nervous. I was like, can I wear this? Like, can I do this? And I remember I went into the bar and I just like the music was playing and I wanted to dance, but I just couldn't let go. Um, And how did you let go? Tequila, tequila, tequila. Makes us very happy. But now I don't need so much tequila. Well, that's good. Yeah. And it's really interesting because you said you gave yourself permission there. You let, you gave yourself permission to let go because you were in New York, you were removed from London. Mm. And earlier on you said that you... You feel you sometimes literally run away from your problems. Yes. Is is that what traveling is to you? Is is it that movement away from from where the issues might be happening? Maybe. And I think that if I if I stay in one place for too long, I don't know. I just feel very stagnant. I feel like I'm not progressing, which yeah. isn't even necessarily true. But I just I like to move. I like to go places. I don't like to stay in one place for a very long time. And when I was growing up, it was always my biggest hope and dream that I would get to travel. Um, So I feel like now that I'm in a position to be able to do that, I will do that. Um, So I'm in a unique kind of situation where um, so Reggie's dad and I share custody of him. So we I know it's very dramatic and new age, but um, we both love him so much and we both get along so well still. So we have him for an equal amount of time. So sometimes I'll have him for a month and then he'll have him for a month or I'll have him for two weeks and he'll have him for two weeks. So if I have a month where I'm not looking after Reggie, I feel like there's nothing really tying me to stay. So then I'm like, okay, well, what do I want to do in this month? You know, and I'm lucky that I can work wherever I am in the world. So then I'll I'll choose. See. So earlier on, you said you find it hard to be in the present. But yeah. It, it sounds to me like you're, you're good at choosing to do that. Well. And, and choosing to take those opportunities. And I love the fact that you share custody of Reggie. I know. I think that's so adult. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a patronising yeah. way. But I think if my husband and I split up, Zach would just be with me all the time. <laughs> I'd be stuffing him into bags and yeah. it would devastate my husband. So, yeah, I think that's... It's hard to share him, but we have remained such good friends and stuff that it just seemed like the natural thing to do and both of us travel a lot and both of us want to have a little bit of freedom as well so it works out for both of us because then he can go travel and do what he wants to do um so that's that's the arrangement that's amazing and i also think that when else am i going to be able to do this you know i'm not getting any younger so i just think if i this is the time it's always the time it's always the time it's always the time to choose yourself and i might not always want to do this but i want to do this right now when the money runs out, I guess I'm going to have to stop flying around the world. Well, but yeah. <laughs> I want to go traveling now. Yeah. So yeah. we've done your three I am. Okay. We're going to move on to talking about anxiety and depression because you've shared with us and you've shared with your followers that you have experienced depression and anxiety. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us a bit about anxiety and depression for you? Absolutely. Well, I was actually thinking on the way over here, like, when is the first time I really felt like I was depressed or low? And I really think it stems from from my young childhood. I remember being like six years old, seven years old and thinking like, why am I feeling so, and it's not a sadness, it's a numbness for me. Mm -hmm. And I remember like seeing all my friends and stuff and they were like having fun and playing. And I remember just always looking at things from like 
a fatigued point of view or like, you know, and I I always just kind of thought that was my way of thinking. And my mom has depression and I, I don't know if maybe some of it's passed down or if I was just kind of like looking at the way she went through the world or what, but it was from a very, very young age. And I also think that I had anxiety from a young age as well, which obviously I didn't know what it was, but I used to get really awful stomach aches. And I still get really bad stomach aches because I think my anxiety can kind of, um, you know, show itself that manifest, way. Manifest, yeah. Yeah, manifest, you know, through physical symptoms. Um, so I feel like I've had it for a while, but it wasn't until I was around uh, 13 or maybe a little older when I had my first panic attack. And I, I I had no idea what it was. You know, back then, not that it was that long ago, but it, it wasn't really discussed. No. At all. No. So when I was in high school, I had no idea what was going on. It's I, terrifying, I thought it was, isn't it, it? It is terrifying. Yeah. And um, I wrote about this in, in my book, but I came home from school and I said to my mom, you know, I think I had this panic attack because I was talking to my librarian about it. And she was like, it could have been a panic attack. And my mom was like, oh, don't be dramatic kind of thing. And that's what she was saying. And she has later apologized and she understands it now because she has had a panic attack. Yeah. But, you know, it was always it was just brushed to the side. And so from that point on, I didn't talk about it. I self-soothed. I tried to deal with it on my own. I bottled all my emotions. And eventually it just got to a point where, like, I couldn't deal with it. Like it was it was crazy. And my depression and my anxiety has changed so much over the years. So I was before I was really anxious in social situations. And that's not the case at all anymore. I'm more anxious just like if I'm by myself or, you know, it's changed so much, which is weird. I think like we were talking about evolving earlier on, I think as we evolve as people. Yeah. The way we think and the way we manage things evolve as well. And and that happens with mental health. It fluctuates. Mm -hmm. So different things become troubling to us, different moments in our life. Absolutely. But it's it's great that you share it um, and it's great that you're able to reflect and recognise it. I mean, yeah. you, you seem to really recognise what you need to do to help you cope. Do yeah. you think that's that's the case? I think so. I am doing a lot of thinking about it recently because over the past year, I've dealt with depression and anxiety more than I've ever had to. I I think just with all the change. I was going to say, you've had a lot of change. Yeah. Um, and it, it, I, I look at it as almost a trauma, you know, kind of what I went yeah. through. Um, it was It was crazy. So now... I feel like I'm in a healthier mindset, but I'm still dealing with it. And I'm trying to find ways where I can really deal with the root cause of it. Um, sometimes I think my job doesn't help matters right. because it's such an exposed lifestyle, yep. um, which can be really hard and overwhelming when you have, you know, hundreds of comments every day being like, why are you in New York so much? And what are you doing here? And are you dating this person? No, you can't be dating this person. She's dating this person. And, you know, it's a constant just feeling open and vulnerable to yeah. people you don't even know. Yeah, and a thousand voices as well. Yep. <laughs> so, Millions, maybe. yeah, and they have a direct line of com communication so they can message me and I see all the comments, even though people don't think I do. I do. Um, but there's obviously the flip side, which is a lot of positive reinforcement and so much support from people. I always say that I could not have got through the past year without that. I, w I was getting so many emails from people being like, Este, I know you're going through a really tough time and I want you to know you're doing amazing. Like, That's just nice. like two lines. Yeah. And it was awesome. Um, but yeah, I really think that I'm realizing more when I'm feeling healthy and when I'm not feeling healthy. And um, I'm trying to feel healthy more of the time. That's And, yeah. and in terms of boundaries, so... We just talked on about social media and it is a double edged sword, isn't yeah. it? Because with with the kindness that you get, you will also get people who are perhaps being judgmental. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but I always remember the negative that can be 80 positive comments mm -hmm. and one negative one. Yep. And I will remember the negative one and I will be able to quote it word for word. Absolutely. And and how do you manage your boundaries around that? Well, I have a much thicker skin now than I have in the past. And I always just try to surround myself with positive people and my real true friends. And 
even if a comment does get to me, sometimes I'll like text my friend and be like, oh, this person said this. And then they'll just be like, oh, like, don't worry about it or whatever it is. Exactly. You know, and it and it helps. It helps so much. And I also just try to remember, you know, they know a version of me. They see a side of me. They yeah. see maybe five or 10 percent of my day. And that's the thing about vlogging. So if I vlog my entire day. Say the vlog is five minutes. Well, there's 24 hours in a day. Yeah. And there's a lot of other things going on as well. So I try to remember that. And I also try to remember sometimes the way I, if I look at, you know, somebody's life, like even if I was to look at like a gossip newspaper or something, which I don't look at, but if I did, you know, I have um, preconceptions about certain celebrities. And I'm like, oh, why is she doing that? Or why is he doing that thing? And you have this thing that you know the person. Yeah. But you don't really know what's going on, no. you know, and, and it's like anybody in your life. You have no idea what's going on in somebody's life. Everyone's fighting a battle you can't see. That is the truth. And has it given you more empathy, do you think, being in the position that you are when you do come across a gossip magazine or yes. a, when you see the Daily Mail sidebar of shame? Yeah. Um, if you look at it, um, does it give you more empathy thinking, actually, that's a version that's, you know, that's that's not what's happening here. Yeah. yeah. I look at that stuff so differently. Do you? Oh, my gosh. So differently. When they take these pictures of people, like, on the beach and stuff like that, and they're, like, pointing out people's cellulite. I hate it. That is insane. Yeah. That is insane. Could you imagine leaving your house and having cameras there? Like, I don't know about you, but when I'm walking my dog in the morning. No. Like, I'm not camera ready. I've brushed my teeth. That's about. I don't even know if I've gone that far. <laughs> because that would be horrible. But, yeah. So yeah. I think there's a lot of judgment out there. I think um, people want to see that stuff. I guess some yeah. people want to see that stuff. I'm not sure, but I'm not trying to look at negative things in my life. I have a lot of negativity in my brain as it is, so I'm trying to just stick with the positives. Exactly. Marvelous. Yeah. Sticking with the positives. Yes. We've talked about Reggie. We've talked about evolving. And we've talked about traveling. And how do all of those things help you stick with the positives? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, I just think there are so many beautiful things that happen every single day. And I'm really trying to notice those things more. I mean, even when I was traveling last week in New York, I stopped because there were all these hearts drawn on the street. You know, and that's just like some little kid has drawn that. Yeah. And I think it's like when you're in any situation, whether it's Reggie is being cute and like drops his toy or something in a cute way, or I see hearts on the street, or I fix my dishwasher by myself. Um, you know, it's like I am trying to just give myself moments to be like, that's cool. That's positive. Notice those things rather than focusing on the negative things yeah. like my oven broke this morning. I can't cook now. I, I don't cook anyway, but like I literally cannot cook anything in my oven now. So, oh, my God, that's something else. Take it as a moment to go and eat somewhere you haven't eaten before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Take a book and have some time to yourself. It's like they say, one day you'll realize the small things are the big things. And it, it seems to me that that's what you're saying in terms of, yeah. you know, Reggie dropping a toy at your feet. Mm -hmm. However many years ago that you got him, he didn't even know how to play with a toy. Right. Look at the difference you've made to his life. So yeah. everything like that has a wonderful backstory. Absolutely. As well. You said it in a much more eloquent and concise way. No, <laughs> I did not. I actually have another thing. I don't know if we've got time for it, but yeah. um, I, I see like a lot of, you know, people who are into like holistic treatment. So acupuncture. I saw a nutritionist the other day. And something that keeps coming up is writing. And I don't know if you've heard of this book. It's called The Artist's Way. And basically yes. it, it preaches this certain thing. It's all about being an artist, blah, blah, blah. But the running theme is that you should wake up every morning and write for 20 minutes, basically. Yeah. And it's just kind of like a brain dump. And so that's my resolution to do. And there's another book. It's something like um, writing is the way to heal. That's not what it's called, but it's something like that. He heal yourself through writing. So that's my new thing, which is to kind of just be like, ah. Just let it all out. Let it all out. Because I do that in yoga. I yep. actually physically will breathe out negativity and I'm going to start doing that. So if anybody's listening, I feel like that could be an interesting thing to look into. Yes, morning pages. Morning pages, exactly. Morning pages, because the idea is I think that your brain is at its kind of yeah. most – crackly and awake yep. at that time in the morning. So whatever you put on the page is kind of what's, yep. what's at the front of your mind. You should start it. I, I January am, morning pages. I know. I want to do it. And then you get rid of the pages. You get rid of them. You throw them away. Do you? Yeah. Because <gasps> you don't need it. 
So we're going to end with one question, which is what would you say to, and we've already touched on this a little bit, what would you say to Este nine years ago about anxiety and depression and and also just life? What would you say to her? I think I would really say to just slow down and you don't have to have the answer to everything. So that's something that I do all the time. I want to start a new project and I want everything done that week, you know, or that day even or that hour. And I think sometimes I put a lot on myself to just know everything about what I'm doing, whether it's a relationship, a work project, anything. And I think it would just be to slow down the pace. Even the way I speak, I talk so fast normally. I'm trying to just breathe, slow down. We're both breathing now. We're yeah. both slowing ourselves down. Um, and just take a little more time with things. Yeah. That's what I would tell myself. That's made me feel very calm. Namaste. Ah, oh, lovely. <laughs> thank you, Este. Thank you so much it's for having me. It's been wonderful. Me. And thank you so much for being our first guest. Oh, thank you. Will you come on again in a year from now? I will. And we'll have this chat again. Okay, I'm very excited to see where I'm going to be in a year. See, there we go. There I'm we thinking go. about the future. We'll, we'll no. do it. Bring it back to the present. We're in the moment. <laughs> thank you. If you'd like to find out more about Este, you can read the article she wrote for us on happerful.com. Check out her website, estelalon.com, where you can also find details of her gorgeous jewellery collaboration with Daisy London and have a listen to her podcast, On The Line. Thank you for listening to I Am, I Have, brought to you by Counselling Directory and Happiful Magazine. If you'd like to read more about mental health and wellbeing, head over to happiful.com and sign up to receive a free e-edition of the magazine every month. If you're looking for local counselling support, you can find over 15,000 counsellors at your fingertips at counselling-directory.org.uk. Finally, if you need to speak to someone immediately, the Samaritans are available 24 hours a day on 116 123. And you can also email joe at samaritans.org. Help is available. This podcast has been produced by Happiful. If you've enjoyed listening, please subscribe, rate, review and share on social media. We hope you'll join us again soon.